So did you stay up and watch that? Really? Like the whole thing? Did you see the third period? Did you see Evgeny Malkin in the third period? Good morning to you. Good Friday morning. I'm Dayan Kovacevic of DK Pittsburgh Sports, and this is Daily Shot of Penguins. It comes your way bright and early every weekday if you're into football and or baseball. I also offer daily shots of Steelers and Pirates in the same place that you found this. Kraken 2, Penguins 0. Yeah, the visitors, they came out like a house ablaze. They were all over Philip Grubauer. Uh, huge advantages through both of the first two periods. And then, you know, the way these games have gone, a lot of them have gone this year. Nobody really goes to the net to make the goaltender's life even remotely difficult. Nobody finishes. Nobody has a clue on the power play, at least not in terms of driving through the middle of the rink. And Seattle scores a a late goal on their own power play by Gasp going to the net and poking home a double rebound past Tristan Jari, as Alex Wenberg did. And that's the game. And that's it. And we're so very far past any stage of this season where you'd be giving out attaboys for this. As I've been insisting for a while now, these Penguins try very hard, but they try to score their way rather than the way that they need to score. Also, and related, my God, what's happened to Gino? In the third period of this game, if he hadn't been in any kind of slump, and you had just seen the two sequences I'm about to describe, you'd still be asking that same question. First sequence. Penguins enter the zone. Three on two. Eric Carlson's coming down the right side. Carlson's drawing people to him the way he always does. Carlson's looking to the slot the way he always does. Carlson feeds across to Gino, right between the hashes. Could not have been a prettier touch, blade to blade. Should have been at least a glorious scoring chance. Gino doesn't collect the puck. Gino decides to one-time it or try to one-time it, completely shanks it with kind of like a half-tap motion, and it goes soft and wide. It was totally non-threatening. Just a couple minutes later, Valtteri Pustinen is moving back in the attacking zone out to the left point, because that's just where the puck was going. And the kid's pretty smart. He's not just going to turn around and fling it in a random direction. He's going to look for a place to pass. And he passes to Gino again, right in the slot. Now, Gino's facing Pustinen, so he's not in any kind of shooting position. But it didn't matter. Because the puck just kind of, uh, off of Gino's blade. And there wasn't even a possession. Now, if you hear me describe these third period messes, and then I add into it that Gino's now got two goals in his past 23 games, going all the way back to New Year's Eve. Two goals in his past 23 games. He has zero in his past 12, and he doesn't even have a shot on goal in two of the past three games, including the one last night in Seattle. That is a great big chasm to have in your offense wherever you're putting him. Never mind in a special space on your depth chart for a living legend who you're expecting, fully expecting to snap out of it any day and become not just productive, but like really highly productive. That's a reasonable expectation on the coach's part. They have every right to be managing this player that way because of who he is, because of what he's done. And as a case in point, I'm going to throw a hypothetical your way. Let's say Gino hits the ice in Calgary tomorrow night and just scorches the flames all night long. Hat trick, couple of assists, 
Not a single person listening to this program would be surprised by that. Not one. Not one. And if you say that you would, you're not being honest. So you don't demote him. You don't scratch him or anything insane like that. You just keep putting him out there, hoping that it'll happen. It's not. And in a way, it feels like not a slump. Because in his past slumps, yeah, he would beat himself up and he would mope a little bit on the rink and it would drag on for a while. You'd wonder what the heck was wrong with him, but mostly from the moodiness standpoint. I don't look at him now and see somebody who's not giving the proper effort. I've seen it in the past. I don't see it now. What I'm seeing out there, and I take no joy in saying this out loud, he looks like he's got a piano on his back. Watch him, in particular, after a rush, after the penguins go up ice. When he has to make the big turn and head back the other way, I know what lazy Gino looks like. That's not lazy Gino. That's Gino with a piano on his back. So one of two things is possible here, as I see it. One, and you almost, in a weird kind of way, hope this is the case, is that he's hurt is that he's playing through something. Now, everybody on every roster in the NHL is playing through something when you get to late February, early March. Everybody's got something, but some have more than others. And Gino did have a little bit of a maintenance period there two or three weeks ago, you might recall, where he was being held out of a couple practices. I never found out what that was for, but he's practicing now. He's participating in all the morning skates. Which leads to, yeah, the other possibility, which is, you know, the whole piano on his back thing. When we come back, J1Q. Today's J1Q comes from David, who asks, DK, when's the last time a Penguins power play unit crashed the net the way the Kraken did for their second goal. Uh, It it actually wasn't that long ago, David. They were starting to do some things with the man advantage that involved the collapsing, is the term that I keep using to describe it, that you want to see from any truly uh, productive and and really uh, probably a better word for it, it would be dynamic power play where you can sense that aggressiveness where they're like a pack of animals that are just closing in on the prey. The team that does this better than any, and this won't surprise you, is Edmonton. The Oilers are unbelievable, actually, at this, where even though you know, Connor McDavid and Leon Dreisaitl alone could rag the puck for the full two minutes in the attacking zone and go untouched, they don't. Those two and everyone else who's out there with them just gradually just inches forward until by the end of it, and it's usually number 29 that's at the final X to the other team's O, getting ready for that big one-timer from the right circle. When you look at Dreisaitl's goals over the course of the season, specifically his power play goals, it's amazing the close range that they come from for a guy who starts out pretty much outside the right circle. He just keeps creeping forward the way they all do. The Penguins have needed to do that for some time. And again, they started to, oh, coming up with an exact date on this isn't isn't easy, but like within the past month, there's been progress in that regard. And in this game last night, there was just nothing of the kind. It was just right around the perimeter as if it was November again. So what ends up happening is there are really two admonitions that the Penguins need to follow. One is that they need to shoot more often. And two is they need to have somebody at the net when they do. What the Penguins did last night and what they've been doing too often of late is they just do the first part. They just shoot it. Okay, well, that's great. You're going to shoot from 50 feet unscreened. You can make even Philip Grubauer in his 870-something Save percentage look good. 
it's not going to do you any good on the scoreboard. So trying to mix it up and then putting Jeff Carter out there on the first power play and, you know, if you have to put other players on your roster onto the power play to do something that all of them should be doing in this situation, the wrong problem is being addressed. I appreciate the question. I appreciate everybody listening to Daily Shot of Penguins. And we're going to do another one of these on Monday.